Welcome back everybody. Today we have something different for you. I'm back actually in my hometown at the Smith & Wesson plant, as you can see behind me. Uh, and basically what we're gonna do is go in there. Uh, they invited us out. We're gonna go in there and check out how guns are made, essentially. Uh, all the different guns in their lineup are produced here at this facility in Springfield, Mass. And we're gonna walk you through some of the processes that go into it, because it is kind of cool to see. A lot of people never really get to see it. Um, so hopefully this will give you an insight as to how your Smith & Wesson gun was made, or maybe one that you're looking at purchasing. Um, I do want to sort of forewarn you. I'm wearing a lavalier microphone, however, it is super loud in there. That's why everybody has to wear ear pro. Um, so some of the audio on the indoors portions may not be that great, but hopefully, again, it'll give you some insight that maybe you didn't have before into what goes into making these firearms. All right guys, so now we're in the performance center and uh, basically back here, what they're making is 1911 frames, uh, performance center revolvers doing all the custom work for that. Actually right behind the camera is where they make the custom parts for it as well. So like they just released the uh, Shield 380 EZ performance center. And behind me, if I can get B-roll, I will. They're actually making the small parts that specifically go into that. But So 1911s are hand fit by hand in there, which you guys should probably see some B-roll of. Uh, all the Performance Center AR triggers, anything that you can think of Performance Center wise is made in this cage right here with their most experienced guns. Behind me right now is where they do any kind of custom engraving. As you can see, it's an individual person doing the engraving, one guy, one gun the whole way through. Uh, right now, I was talking to him earlier, and you guys should see the B-roll of the revolver he's working on. But he said that one's gonna take him about two and a half weeks to complete. It's actually a set of two. So uh, very labor intensive, old school skills that you just can't train, you can't mass produce. All right guys, now we're in the forge area. Unfortunately, it's not working right now, but here, if you guys can kind of look behind the door there is where they do all the steel forging. They also do aluminum and scandium forging. Those require obviously less you know, pressure and stuff. So the steel's where all the heavy lifting is. But like I said, it's not going right now. But this is where they do the forging for you know, your 1911 frames, uh, scanning revolvers, all of those sorts of things. Now we're in the section of the plant where they take a raw forged revolver frame and they actually do the milling on the CNC machines to get it down. A little bit closer to what you guys would recognize. Of course, there's a lot of other steps after they do that, but all of these machines behind me, these are all revolver frame uh, CNC mills. So uh, very cool. And one thing that is crazy about this factory is just the scale of it. I've been to a lot of gun factories. The scale here is truly impressive. There is just so much machinery, so much stuff getting done. Probably you guys can hear it as well. It's not exactly quiet. A lot of work happening. So what you guys see here is how they come in before they're milled out, the forged on your right, and over there on the left is how they come out of that machine. Once the forged frames come out of the mills, they go to one of the polishing areas. This is one that you guys see here, where people are still polishing these frames by hand. So very cool to see in action. That's what's going on behind you. You guys see some wheels, machinery, all of that sorts of stuff. Stuff that collects the dust to make sure it doesn't get, obviously, it pokes along all the safety equipment that goes with that. But yeah, they're hand polishing all that stuff, so cool to see. Now in this section of the factory, as you guys can see, they're taking these barrel blanks, which are pretty darn heavy, pretty darn long, and they're doing all the contours with the machinery behind it. They're doing basically everything to the barrels outside of putting the rifling in. So the rifling happens in a different place. Most of the uh, barrels here would be button rifled. And then if they have any sort of armor night finish or any uh, nitrocarburization that happens, that happens after as well. Of course, not all their barrels have that treatment, but this is where it starts out. This is what your barrel starts out looking like. And then it goes through, again, these machines and other processes to make it what you guys get off your gun range. The factory here is comprised of two different buildings and what connects them is sort of this underground tunnel. Uh, this of course was built during the Cold War years so it's not just a tunnel that you know connects the factories allowing workers to go back and forth but it also can serve as an improvised bomb shelter should that need arise and uh, of course you know if you think back historically like when we attacked the um, Japanese and Germans we went after their arms factory so that was a concern here on the domestic front as well which is again another reason that they built this Tunnel underground. This section of the factory is particularly loud, so again, apologize on the audio if it's bad, but this is where they do all the heat treating. So uh, what you guys see here for all this blue stuff that I'm sure contains chemicals and pressurized stuff that I don't understand because I am not an engineer, uh, basically is what's feeding this line right here. So you can see the numbers on it going one through I think 15, and it just comes down in a stage through the heat treating process for the metal. So 
Um, heat treating is important for any number of reasons, and depending on the part, they require a different type of heat treating. Depending on the metal, they require a different type of heat treating. Uh, again, Smith & Wesson's been doing this stuff a long, long time. Uh, some of the equipment you actually see here is from, I think, 1939, they were saying. So uh, they do it right. My experience, I've never seen bad heat treating on a Smith & Wesson product, and it's all the byproduct of this process and these machines that you see right here. As I said, guys, there's a lot of other processes that go into the barrel after you know going through the contouring and all that stuff. This gentleman here is finishing up some 300 wind mag barrels, so going through the process, setting the uh, receiver extension, checking the gauge, all of those sorts of things. If I can actually scroll up, that's exactly what he's doing there. So uh, going through it, and then, sorry for the camera being about to be panned, they're all gonna end up there in that stack getting ready to go on to the next production. All right guys, now we're in the engineering department for Gemtech where they do a lot of testing on their cans just basically to make sure that stuff's meeting their standards. They have some pretty cool guns right here beside me, so I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of gun porn here. So, of course, fully transferable uh, MP5 on here. We have the uh, GM, or excuse me, the Lunar 45 uh, can. It's a nine millimeter gun, but the 45 cans, of course, will work as well. I'm sure some of you guys that watched my review on this rifle know what this one is. But out here on the end, uh, the can here we have is the Shield 556. Uh, I believe this is a fully automatic rated can, is that correct? I believe it is. Yeah, I don't have one of these. May have to get one. Um, <laughs> and then here is a pretty cool gun. So we have our full auto uh, M249 type rifle. It may be a MK46, I'm not sure. Uh, 8, 48, excuse me, it is. Uh, so. It is chambered in 300 blackout though, which is cool, and it has the uh, GMT 300 blackout can on there. If you guys have never fired a belt-fed 300 blackout and you have the opportunity, highly recommend it. It's super fun. And uh, this one here with subs, the loudest thing is just the bolt going back and forth. Very, very cool. Of course, your M&P pistol with a GM9 on there. It's pretty lightweight, pretty small. Uh, obviously has the piston on there to function correctly with the browning style action. This one right here you're not going to see very often either. Obviously a Swiss gun and uh, we have the GMT halo on there. The halo is cool because it mounts up on an A2. Uh, so if you want to sort of move your cans around you have a bunch of A2 flash hiders, definitely one to look at. We have this one here that you guys have seen on my channel. It's a LWRC rifle of course and uh, we have the Gentech the one can on there. Very easy to pop on and off, quick to attach. Uh, they make different mounts for it, really a bunch of different calibers, and also other companies make mounts for it, which is cool as well. So if you don't just want to use a Gemtech mount, or if you already have one made from like Landtac or something like that, it is compatible with this suppressor. And as you guys just saw, quick detach uh, to put on and off. This is the Gemtech Integra, so it's an inter integrally, if I could speak correctly, uh, 300 blackout suppressed AR-15 upper with a uh, Seekins M-Lock rail on there. We'll zoom in, you guys can kind of see that that's about where the barrel ends. And then of course this is just suppressors and uh, baffles, or rather a tube and baffles underneath it. Very quiet guns, I've shot these at shows, uh, but I do not have one, may have to get one. Anyway, we'll keep moving on. I think I mentioned earlier that some of the machines here have been in use since 1939. So what you see behind me is not any sort of gun production machinery or operations that are going on. What they're doing here is they actually fix all their tools in house. Uh, and of course with really old machines, parts aren't available anymore, so they make them in-house. So that's what this is. This is basically a maintenance facility, but I thought it was kind of cool just to show you that what they're doing uh, to keep this operation going, you know, decade after decade here. That's going to conclude the factory tour portion. There's some areas that we didn't show you because either A, they weren't operational or B, we couldn't. Um, but you could kind of get a good idea, I think, hopefully from this video, as to what goes into making at least revolvers, pistols, barrels, those sorts of things uh, across the different lineup of companies that Smith & Wesson owns and, of course, within their own brand as well. Uh, some of the Gemtech stuff we saw, again, obviously it was cool. They said off camera they have some new stuff in development. So I'll be looking forward to seeing uh, how all of that plays out and comes to market down the road as well. But I want to thank the folks over at Smith & Wesson for inviting me out today, uh, giving me really pretty close to unlimited access to their factory. Um, I was out here 25 plus, maybe 30 years ago for a Boy Scout tour, and uh, this place has grown a lot. The scale is, is definitely huge, and it's good. It's good to see the growth, and uh, I definitely uh, like taking an inside peek as to what's going on there. If you guys have any questions, definitely post them down below. You can also post those over at my Facebook page as well. That's the best place to reach me if you actually need a question answered, because I see all the messages over there, and I don't always hear on YouTube and elsewhere, but that's it, guys. 
Uh, thanks for watching. If you like what you saw here and you're not subscribed, please go ahead and subscribe. And I look forward to seeing all of you in the next video.